My talk today is on debate technology for empowering the public. So in the next 25 minutes, I'll give you a brief overview of some of the key linguistic insights and um, patterns that we need to deal with when developing such technology. But I'll also give you an overview of uh, the avenues that are being presented to us when designing such a system and the requirements that we need to meet. So um, debate technology has seen a massive uptake in the last 10 years. Um, culminating in uh, IBM's Project Debater being launched in 2018. And I, I guess you've heard a lot of, uh, of Project Debater in the previous keynote, so I don't need to say a lot more. Um, but it's character characteristic of a field that's, that has seen an immense rise in the last decade. And what we're seeing in NLP is that we have a focus on statistical models across various areas of discourse processing, imagine discourse coherence, argument mining, sentiment analysis, and conversational AI, among many others. Uh, and we also see an ever increasing amount of textual and now also spoken data available. But what we're seeing is that most of the data that is used for developing these statistical models is raw. So it's just the text or it's annotated very shallowly imagine parts of speech. And that's because annotation is expensive. And because annotation is expensive, most, most of the methods that are used to extract the information are shallow. So imagine you have different types of features like type token ratio, you're taking into account anagrams or some other low level annotation like the parts of speech. So this has proven useful for many NLP tasks, but what we're starting to see is that the, this way of dealing with language, we're starting to reach the limit of what we can do with statistics. Uh, and a, a very good example is if we're taking natural language debate um, and in particular argumentation in those uh, debates. So here is an example from a moral maze. It's a BBC Radio 4. A, show on the, a weekly show discussing uh, complex moral issues and it's this is an example from uh, an episode on the morality of money. Um, and here let's start with um, an example. We have Michael Potillo. He's giving um, an, an argument and some of the arguments are indicated with uh, explicit discourse connectors like because here and what we, for example, see in natural language is that the premise here, aren't they lenders? It's not an assertion, it's a question, it's formulated as an interrogative, and in fact, it's, it's a rhetorical question. Another very common and very typical pattern is this, that um, people, that arguments spread across, um, across turns, across utterances. So here we have Michael Potillo again, this is a second highlighted bit. And he attacks um, an assertion that was done by Simon Rose. So we have long distance dependencies between discourse units that we need to take into account. And then we have things like I wonder, so uh, constructions, epistemic markers, which introduce um, interrogative structure and that we need to deal with. So I've for some time um, thought about how do I fit in? So I'm a linguist by training, but I, I can, uh, of course, apply natural language NLP, um, NLP methods to, to deal with these linguistic issues. And the, the, the label that I kind of gave myself is I'm doing computational rhetoric. And I understand computational rhetoric as a way to deal with the intention of speakers, to capture their rhetorical strategies, to, to look at the way argumentation unfolds in dialogue and explore the network of explicit and implicit discourse information. So provide the linguistic basis and then use computational models to automatically identify those structures. And what is the basic requirement is that we need to combine theoretical linguistics with statistical models of language. So we need both sides uh, of that coin. Uh, back in 2016, we had looked at um, discourse in the context of the Stuttgart 21 mediation. So the mediation revolving around the new train station being developed in Stuttgart. 
And one of the insights that we gained is that we need to take into account particles. So things like ja, doch, schon, halt in German, which are extremely frequent in dialogical argumentation, but had so far been not looked um, at all. So if you look at the relative frequencies of explicit arguments containing some of those discourse particles, we see that in about 30 to 40% of explicit arguments, we have those discourse particles and they're extremely important to relate the speaker and uh, uh, her utterance to the unfolding discourse. And I'll, I'll give you an example um, later on. Um, the second insight that we gained is that we can categorize that rhetorical information and in order to make it usable for computational purposes. So the dimensions, we had five higher level dimensions were the common ground. So speakers try to relate to the common ground, the shared knowledge of the discourse participants in various ways. Then we have different ways of ex expressing constraints. So a, a person communicates that he or a, a matter is, is subject to, to external constraints, for example. We have ways of re, um, getting accommodation, so bringing people together, making them agree on a certain standpoint. We have lexical items indicating what's the question and the discussion, so what's the topic that is being talked about. And of course, we have discourse maneuvers that indicate that somebody tries to save their own or their interlocutor's face. So we have different categories that, that we can use uh, and that we can reliably identify in natural language communication. One way to analyze those uh, structures in large amounts of discourse data is visual analytics. And here I paired up with Menatala al Asadi, also here in Constance. And we were looking at rhetorical strategies in Stuttgart 21. So here we're looking at the four groups, uh, the four sort of stakeholders in Stuttgart 21. It's the neutral uh, standpoint on the left, that was the moderator. We have pro and contra, so people for or against the um, construction of that, that train station. And we have the experts that were called in uh, and that remained um, that provided neutral feedback. So we have in that glyph, we have the different types of discourse um, connections. So the discourse components, we have conditions, we have reasons or premises, we have conclusions, oppositions and concessions. And we see that the, depending on the speaker, they, they have different shapes. So for example, Pro and contra are very similar, so they provide many reasons, also give a lot of conditions, and all of those features were identified automatically in the discourse, and there was some degree of opposing certain standpoints. However, if you look at the experts, they exhibit a very different uh, pattern, so we have a lot of um, premise, reason, conclusion giving, which is obvious given their role in the discourse that they had to argue for certain positions and, and give the reasons for them. The neutral, so Heiner Geisler, the mediator, he behaved again differently. So he used many concessions. He tried to bring people together to, to form a coherent um, picture. Um, there's not a lot of opposition, but he drew many conclusions. The glyphs that you're seeing here are a way of aggregating a lot of information in one single visual representation, which allows us to, to identify differences in the patterns at a first glance. So this was very interesting. Uh, the post-talk analysis um, gave us a lot of information on what happened in Stuttgart 21. But while doing that, I thought, well, why not develop technology that can do that in real time? And this led to um, the ADAPT project, uh, short for Augmented Deliberative Democracy. It's a project that is funded by the Volkswagen Stiftung from 2017 to 2021. And the overall aim is to develop technology that can run in parallel to a public debate, track and analyze um, the, the structure of the debate. For example, which arguments are being given, who's speaking, for how long, how do people relate to individual claims made in the debate and who, who is relating to who else in the discourse. I have two, or in fact, three co-applicants. One is Valentin Gold from Political Science, and um, is Brian Plus from uh, Art Tech in Dundee, and Connor 
uh, software engineer who's implementing that technology. The way the system is going to work is um, shown here. So we have a, a list of participants that contribute to the discourse. Their length of contribution, contribution is given here on the timeline. Um, but more importantly, we have what we call the argument tree here. Edges in red symbolize conflicts between nodes. Edges in green support um, our supports. And edges in yellow constitute rephrases of a previous uh, point. Um, so people get an idea of what are the, uh, the issues in the debate, what are the propositions or the, the nodes that are being agreed with among the interlocutors and on the right hand side here we what we is what we call the lexical episode plots is a way to showcase which lexical items are highly frequent in spans of a debate in a sense that they're more frequent than expected um, so this is a way of getting a topical overview of of the debate um, um, given that we're speaking about argumentation today, I want to present uh, one phenomena that I want to focus on in the next um, next one or two years of my research, in fact. And it, it's based on the fact that argumentation is mostly implicit. And we see this with indicators like because, where if we find a because, there's a precision of around 90% that this constitutes because, in, in fact, signals um, a support relationship between individual discourse units. But recall is only around 4%. So we capture, using because, we only capture 4% of all support relations that there are. Um, however, in natural debate, in natural spontaneous discourse, there's a, another way to dis uh, dis discover or identify implicit material and this is conventional implicatures. Um, conventional implicatures are a type of meaning that have a long-standing history uh, in the philosophy, uh, philosophy um, of linguistics. And um, it's the example that I'm giving here is in two, it's borrowed from POTS 2005. Alice says, luckily Willie won the pool tournament. And Bob replies, that's not good though. So what happens in that exchange. So we have Alice um, and Bob. So what Alice asserts is that Willie won the pool tournament. What Bob asserts is that Willie winning the pool, pool tournament is not good. That's again an assertion. So where, where um, or what does luckily contribute? What luckily contributes, if we ex um, explicate that, is Willie winning the pool tournament is positive. And that's the conventional implicature. That's the proposition that is conventionally implicated. It is not asserted. And the conflict between Alice and Bob is between that asserted proposition of Willie winning the pool tournament is not good and willing, Willie winning the pool tournament is positive. Right? So that is where the conflict resides in. And that's the interesting bit. And it's a sort of... Uh, what what you see here is the tip of the iceberg phenomena. So you have a small linguistic cue on the surface, on the linguistic string, but then you have and an, it unfolds unfolds an, an, a, a big argumentative structure underneath. And this structure we want to get at with computational means. Um, and that's my topic of research um, at the moment and in the next couple of years. So um, there's two ways of mining such implicit structure. Um, uh, first, a supervised approach. So I'm working with Chris Reed and his team at the Center for Argument Technology in, Tan in Dundee. It's an interdisciplinary team and parts of that, uh, members of that team um, have developed um, a framework a theoretically well-motivated framework for argumentation in dialogue. And here we can surface those implicit structures. And um, we've done that last year and, uh, and we showed that the framework is flexible uh, enough to 
to be enhanced with that type of um, argumentative structure, with implicit argumentative relations. Using IAT inference anchoring theory, that framework, uh, we have access to AIFDB, the Argument Interchange Framework database, um, which um, is the database for um, having for storing argumentative relations across theoretical frameworks. And then we have the argument mining framework, so the state of the art uh, framework for um, uh, mining arguments in natural language discourse, natural language debate. So using that um, using inference anchoring theory, we have access to a lot of computational infrastructure. However, the challenge, the real challenge is with the, is with the indeterminacy of implicit meaning. So the meaning that is implicitly conveyed has no definite or definable value. And if we go back to example two, luckily Will, Willy won the pool tournament. The question is, question is, what's the proposition that's conventionally implicated? And in fact, that luckily con can contribute a multitude of propositions. For example, Willy winning the pool tournament is positive. It is positive that Willy won, blah, blah, blah. it's good that, it's good for him, us, that. So there's a general sense of something being positive, something being good, but the exact proposition that is conventionally implicated is not clear. And in an unsupervised approach, what we will make use of is we'll create a hybrid model. So we know the syntactic constituents that are required in that implicit proposition, but we'll also make make use of, of large statistical models like uh, uh, word to vec doc to vec in order to get either at the complete proposition or just at the individual what is a building blocks so something being positive something being good so the lexical semantics the exact lexical semantics contributed is not is not one single item but it's a vector um, of um, like a vector of words Right. So um, the insights um, that we gained when we made, um, when we approached um, partners um, um, back back in 2018, is what was one question: How active want we do we want the system to be? Do we merely want a visual debate representation, or can we offer an automatic intervention that can make a deliberation or a public decision process better? Um, so we uh, conducted a discussion forum in Dundee in Scotland. Um, uh, I want to add that uh, the UK has already a system of, uh, as they call it, public inquiries. So they have the system of discussing um, topics on a local level, but also uh, on a county wide level. So we conducted that forum and what uh, what they were very clear about is that have the system intervene when the debate becomes too emotional or for example intervene when people repeat themselves or others so make the system an active debate participant in those public inquiries however on the other hand we were also talking to the ministry of the interior here in baden-württemberg and representatives of the city of stuttgart and they merely want a debate representation analysis they don't want an in-room analysis, not even that. So what they want to have is a web interface with a live analysis of the debate. So keep the debate as it is, keep the dynamics of the debate as it is, but have people, uh, give people the opportunity to access the debate, to, to, um, to take part in it. Um, and given the recent developments, having a virtual uh, interface to public decision-making processes um, is, is in fact uh, quite high on their list. Uh, the general um, take-home message was be flexible if you, if you uh, want to offer public-facing debate technology because different stakeholders have different opinions and requirements. Um, one question that we are being asked basically every time that we get in touch with uh, stakeholders is how can we build trust in debate technology? And what I usually um, quote is that there is work and in fact work that I've contributed to regarding explainability and the question how does an algorithm accomplish what it is accomplishing. My previous work 
in, in that field, we had we paired linguistics and computational linguistics with uh, visual analytics. And there's a strong collaboration of that here in Constance. So um, there was one effort um, where we worked towards explainable AI using visual analytics. Um, and here we were looking at different types of deliberation dialogues or so public making, public decision making processes. And some of those processes, um, they came to a conclusion, so they reached consensus at, uh, consensus at the end, and some of the others didn't. And we have the largest corpus of comparable, unconstrained, face-to-face -face deliberative dialogue in German, and we're going to release that soon, in fact. Um, and what we did was segment, uh, sequential pattern mining. So we have a, an array of linguistic features. Um, it's in a total of 42 linguistic features that we extract from that discourse and we do sequential pattern mining. So we find common frequent subsequences of those, I mean, discrete symbols, but in this case, linguistic patterns. And a traditional approach would be to train a classifier, no consensus versus consensus, and then the classifier is a black box. The approach that we're taking is a human AI co collaboration. So we encode the patterns, the, the linguistic features visually. Here we have two discourses. We have one and two, and we do find recurrent patterns. So we have a list of uh, five um, features here. And these, the sequences of those features, they are valid across debates. And we highlight those that are valid or found across debates. And then we integrate the human in the loop. So we get annotators in, they judge whether those patterns are in fact hinting at consensus or no consensus, and they record that. And based on that, on that human judgment, we can adjust the weighting of the classifier. We also enable detection of new patterns. So if, if uh, the annotators find patterns that are characteristic, but are, have not been detected, were not common enough to be detected by the sequential pattern mining, they can mark them and they'll be again uh, used for further uh, classification. Eventually, we're able to extract discourse patterns or in fact strategies for promoting agreement and disagreement in public decision-making processes. Right, back to add up uh, and two slides on some of the avenues that we're pursuing. So there's one follow-up project um, that I've submitted to the Cluster of Excellence um, here in Constance, the politics of inequality. And what we're building on is some of the core technology of add up to measure inequality in street level bureaucracy. So political science has seen that some of the inequality in society, some of the uh, inequality in income distribution um, originates in public service encounters. So face-to-face -face meetings between clients and service providers, for instance, uh, in the Arbeitsagentur. So what we're doing is we're using parts of the ADAP system to measure rhetorical strategies and dialogical moves in these face-to-face -face encounters. Uh, we want to study whether the systematic dis differences in communication lead to differences in client satisfaction and with the ultimate aim to elicit those factors that make public service delivery more equal. A second avenue of uh, collaboration that we're pursuing at the moment is represented here by a white slide because I can't say much about it. We're collaborating with uh, media co collaboration, media corporation, sorry, um, in making some of their material more accessible in real time, create visual representations of what is going on in debate, what arguments are being mentioned, how do people relate to individual claims in the discourse. And uh, we're very excited, but I can't say much more. But this is a another avenue that, that empowers the public to, to help form opinions and contribute to the public discourse. All right, with that, I want to wrap up. Um, so what I wanted to show in this talk was that if we mine dialogical structures in natural spontaneous communication, we need to take into account linguistic structure. Um, and this allows us to create hybrid models. So we can combine the power of machine learning with that theoretical linguistic information. 
I've also shown that we can use visual analytics to shed light on large amounts of data and get insights into interesting patterns. Um, and in fact, what results from that is computational rhetoric is in fact fundamental to debate technology. I want to thank everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks to the organizers for having me. If you have any questions and comments, I've said that before, please send me an email uh, and I'll be happy to get back to you. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the workshop. Bye bye.